again, and welcome to an extended engineering announcement for the radio and television trade, the last of 1984. The greater part of this bumper Christmas edition is a nostalgic look back at the 405 line television service, which closes for good in early January. We've also got to catch up on this year's final batch of new UHF relays, of which five are still due to come on the air before Christmas. Two are in Northern Ireland, Plumbridge and Gortnagira. Then there's Warnersh near Guildford, Gathley Vendergaard in Mid Glamorgan and Westbourne in Bournemouth. The first week of January signals the end of an era in television history, the closure of the last of the monochrome VHF 405 line transmitters. The 405 line system was invented 50 years ago on a Sunday morning in 1934. This was in the home of the electronics genius Alan Dyer Bloomline, a member of the EMI research team led by Sir Isaac Schoenberg. The first experimental television transmissions were on John Logie Baird's 30 line system, later upgraded to 240 lines. But the rotating mechanical drums and mirrors couldn't compete with the lightweight all electronic system developed by EMI. The BBC began regular programmes in November 1936, broadcast from Alexandra Palace, Channel 1 in VHF Band 1. The bed system was finally abandoned some three months later. It was in 1954 that Parliament passed the Television Act to set up the Independent Television Authority. By then, VHF Band 1 was fully occupied by BBC transmissions. The ITA had to build up coverage in a new and previously unused part of the VHF broadcast spectrum, Band 3. In 1955, the BBC moved their transmitter to Crystal Palace in South East London, and the ITA decided that their first station should be built nearby. At a site on West Norwood Hill in Croydon, the temporary station used a single laboratory prototype transmitter on Channel 9, the ERP initially 60 kilowatts from a 200-foot mast, sufficient to give good coverage over a wide area. After just nine months of hectic preparation, Regular test transmissions started on the 13th of September, 1955. Programs began on the 22nd of September. Five months later, the second ITV transmitter came on the air, Litchfield serving the Midlands. Much of the original equipment is still there, although the present mast and aerial were brought into service in 1961. At the transmitter, right from the start, Bill Arnold. What were the early days like? Well, we had quite a hectic run-up over the Christmas period. The staff were here from about the 1st of December when there was no roof on this section of the building. In fact, we started life in the pantry. And then we helped Pi put the place together and in a short six-week period had the transmitters in and working all ready for, for just the one set of transmitters for opening day. There was quite a rush to get on the air. There was indeed. Was the, the building had not even been started until the previous June. Now this equipment uh, dates from that time, does it not? Uh, it's in remarkably good condition, uh, but it's being made obsolete. Are you going to be sorry to see it go? Oh, naturally. Although we have plenty of other work to do, and the maintenance load that this presents, uh, we can well do without. It's getting very old, and it's an awful lot of the components now are unobtainable. The valves and so on? That's right. What's going to happen to this equipment? Well, this equipment, unfortunately, will be just carted out the door, I believe, and scrapped, because it has really no use for anybody else. We have been fortunate on some of the slightly later equipment of um, uh, giving it away to hospitals and the like for further use. But at this age, the equipment really is not uh, fit for much further use. Now, I wonder if you could tell me about uh, some of the things that have happened at this transmitting site in the days you've been here. Problems with the weather, for example. Luckily, we are fairly close to the A5, so the worst we have to do is walk in from the bottom of the road. But, of course, that was much more critical in the days when we switched it on every morning and off at night and had an evening shift here. These days, of course, the television in general is fully automatic. But in those days, we used to have to walk in and obviously start up extra early if the weather was bad in order to switch on in time for the morning test card. I don't think we ever missed it. One uh, Boxing Day morning, a main transformer blew up and uh, th there was a wind that things weren't quite right and one of the engineers actually walked five miles in across the fields in the snow. We've also had exciting times here of open days. 
uh, we had about four of them in all, and the most successful, 10,000 people queued to walk through this very spot to see what we did, because there was magic in television, real magic in those days. And of course, the thing that we have in our own homes now, the videotape machine, would occupy a room of this size when we think back to those days. It's amazing how things have come on. Do you think it's sad that television isn't quite such a novelty these days, that people aren't, aren't perhaps as fascinated as they used to be? Naturally, I do, because I still like theatre as a novelty against cinema, because of the discreet performance I think adds to it, and the fact that we switched it on every day, we seem to have a much greater personal interest in all that went on. Even though we had nothing to do with the programming, we felt a great affinity to those that did. And for instance, Noel Gordon came and had tea with us in the days of Tea with Noel Gordon, and that dates one, because that was way back in 1956-57. Right, stand by everyone. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Two grams and take it. Good evening. Here is the news from ITN. From Cape Canaveral, it's just been reported that following Colonel Glenn's success yesterday, another American space flight is to be made in the spring. And further orbits will be made every two months this year. And next year, a two-man space ride that will last a week. Meanwhile, Colonel Glenn's in excellent shape. This was announced today on Grand Turk Island in the Bahamas, where he was flown last night after being pulled from the Atlantic. He's spending 48 hours on the island having medical checks and being interrogated. And then Stand he will fly back to Cape Canaveral on Friday for a oh, hero's fine. welcome. Through all the lengthy preparations... I think I did. I'm just looking a little lonely there with this etching. <laughs> Are you in a low or a high mood today, Laurie? Ah, always high. We've got to be. Miserable stories we put out. Lou Seven, take one. Q Hugh. And now for more down-to-earth matters, pay. The big railway unions today formally accepted Dr. Beeching's 3% pay offer. It will come into force on April the 1st and will mean between 5 and 8 shillings a week. More In 1969, more all ITV studios switched over to 625 line production. Standards converters were installed at the transmitters, each one using more than 2,000 transistors. The 405 line network had been extended to 47 transmitters, covering 98.7% of the population. But the start of colour on UHF in 1969 signalled the eventual demise of the 405 line system. But even though UHF coverage is now up to 99.5%, what about the few who still watch 405? Brian Rhodes. Uh, we are trying to locate these people by uh, having a, a notice on the screen of the 405 line saying that this service will be closing permanently at the end of this year and hope that they will write in to us and we can advise them to see whether we could help them or not. And what sort of response have you had? We've had very few letters. I don't think we've got 10 letters, believe it or not, at the moment. And we have been telling them that the service uh, was going off since um, about the beginning of September. Television and Radio 1985. It's a lively, colourful book full of features, background stories, 
pictures and facts about independent television and radio, about the future, and much, much more. It's all in Television and Radio 1985, price £3.90, in your bookshops now. And that indispensable volume gets us conveniently back to thinking about the present day. The new relay at Wanash is...